Monsieur le Conseiller fédéral, Frau Staatssekretärin, dear David, dear Francisco, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and also a great pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Swiss Federal Office of Culture and Europa Nostra. Mr. Oliver Martin, I'm from the Federal Office of Culture and I will guide you through this event. How will we live together is the theme of uh, this year's Biennale. Our response to that question is the call for high quality Baukultur. And since the Davos Declaration in 2018, this debate on Baukultur, on quality, on how to shape our building environment for the well-being of people, as important as it is necessary, has been taking place at all levels. And the Davos Baukultur quality system with its eight criteria that actually define what we mean when we say quality has further spurred the discussion. And tonight we are very happy to be able to continue this reflection here in Venice with high-ranking guests this evening together with you in the hall and also on live stream. And I would like to thank Europa Nostra for the opportunity and the great cooperation. Sir David Chipperfield will give the keynote speech. An introduction of uh, David Chipperfield with this audience is almost superfluous. As world-renowned architect, he has built many landmarks and much talk about buildings around the world. He has won a series of awards, including the European Mies van der Rohe Award, as well as the European Heritage Europa Nostra Award. Ladies and gentlemen, who better to enlighten us on the quality of Baukultur? Tour? We are very happy to have you today with us. Sir David Chibupield, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, not to confuse the technical team, I'm actually not going to show slides until the very end. I'll just show a few at the end, so they shouldn't panic if I'm not pressing buttons. Uh, ministers, secretaries of state, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues. Um, it is a pleasure for me to say some words. Um, uh, keynote speeches are the worst speeches you can give because somehow you've got to consolidate a number of points very quickly and um, I don't find that so easy. But I am very happy to uh, talk here in support of and acknowledging the importance of Europa Nostra Foundation, which uh, I know well, and especially today in support of the Davos Balkultura quality system, which um, I've only recently become familiar with, and I'm very impressed with its intentions. Um, it's wonderful to be in Venice. It's difficult to think of a more appropriate place in the world to discuss the importance of architecture and the built environment than this extraordinary city. Not only because of the quality of individual buildings, of which there are so many, but for the collective form of building and public space in celebration of our inventiveness, ingenuity, and fantasy. Thank you. The extraordinary, beautiful, and artificial construction finds a surprising relationship to nature putting itself in a ceaseless relationship with the elements. Because of this, it is no surprise that Venice itself has been the setting for so much contemplation about the power of architecture and concerning the principles of protection and reconstruction. Venice has provided the setting for discussion about architecture from Palladio to Ruskin and in contemporary times as the venue for the Biennale exhibition of architecture. It is a city that represents perhaps more than any other the collaboration between architecture and nature, between continuity and change, and in our own time, the challenges of mass tourism that undermine the social coherence of the city itself. Venice illustrates the challenges of our time, the potential of architecture and urban substance, the dependence on the natural environment, and the importance of a coherent community easily challenged by the excesses of tourism and global consumption. Coming to the Davos 
declaration, the discussion about architecture and the quality of built environment is a complicated one, and its focus shifts with each generation. Given the challenges of global warming and social inequality, we sit here at a time when we must address ourselves to issues that affect much more than architecture and design, but which must determine in future the role of, of our professional practice. Clearly, it is our challenge to consider how we might focus our efforts in anticipation and in response to these conditions we find ourselves in. My profession, like the rest of the society, is rather confused. We know we must act, but we aren't sure how. To make things worse, for the last 30 years or, for the last 30 years or so, we have become more isolated from real societal engagement. Unlike the post-war generation, my own generation has been more in the service of the forces of investment than in the service of society. We therefore enter this difficult period unprepared in the way that we have underestimated the importance of planning and perhaps we've over relied on the quality of single buildings to indicate the status and health of architecture, the, indent the identity of environment and the importance of our profession. The Davos Declaration and the quality system co correctly identify what our new priorities must be. In order to do this, it has had the courage to embrace the word quality, a measure that is slippery and difficult to catch, a measure that is always fighting against more definite uh, measures of time and money. In reality, how can we protect and enable the aspirations of this declaration? Functionality, environment, economy, diversity, context, sense of place, and beauty are aspirations that have been identified so many times before. Why will this be any different? If we discuss the quality of our environment and of architecture, we must begin with the understanding of place and context, which the Davos Declaration identifies. And in many of these considerations, this requires us to understand better the idea of protection and giving value and importance of existing buildings and existing conditions. Development and protection must go hand in hand. Understanding and a willingness to engage more thoroughly and with more commitment with existing buildings, both in terms of meaning and memory and increasingly as part of a sustainable approach to development is critical to the way we must work. We can take some confidence from the progress that has been made in this area and a growing understanding that the protection of buildings of obvious monumental status and quality must be the basis of a more general understanding of protection and giving value to a more general concept of protection that includes less obvious buildings that contribute to the identity and character of our environment and is more, and more difficult to define the less tangible aspects of cultural and social heritage. The existential challenges of our time, global warming and social inequality, mean that all development must be measured by the contribution it makes to these issues, not just involving strategies of mitigation, but by positive engagement. This inevitably gives extra legitimacy, as if it were needed, to the concept of protection, reuse, and the repurpose of existing buildings. Since its creation nearly 60 years ago, Europa Nostra has continuously fought for the protection of cultural heritage. Much has changed over the 60 years. Societally, we have become more aware of the importance of protecting our cultural heritage, and our ideas of what constitutes that cultural heritage have also developed. This evolution has run parallel with a greater interest in culture generally, and without doubt, it is encouraged by the economic importance of the cultural sector and cultural tourism. It is in our nature 
to cherish objects, buildings, and places. We value them for their memories, associations, and the ideas that they carry, and those that we have invested in them. The protection and caring of physical heritage is intrinsic to our understanding of the human condition. It is one of the ways by which we celebrate the continuity of mankind's endeavor and constant desire to civilize ourselves. Context and history are somehow compressed by the direct appreciation, something made by human effort and intimate talent. The impulse to protect, to repair, and even to restore is not only out of respect for previous civilizations, but is, it is also part of how we define ourselves in our own time. The idea of protection is not a difficult one to promote when we talk about objects, artifacts, paintings, sculptures. There is no real reason <clears throat> for resistance and no particular societal threat against works beyond that of indifference, laziness, and perhaps ignorance. When we come to buildings, however, and the built environment, we know the situation is different and the challenges are more complex. Buildings or spaces cannot be put in storage. They occupy valuable land and they are often the subject of changing uses and conflicting purposes. On this front line, there are many casualties and it is not so easy to maintain the perspective against other commercial or even political pressures. The instruments and governance required to establish and monitor an intelligent line of protection are fragile and easily brushed aside. Invariably, the protection of buildings or parts of the built environment becomes an act of resistance. And in this process of confrontation and attrition, the initiatives are confused and invariably the result is hollow for both sides. Although we can be confident that the desire to protect our heritage is now better understood, that the appreciation of the past may be stronger, and that we are increasingly charmed by the historical centers of our cities. We also know that the general conditions that shape our environment seem more ruthless and more careless than ever. The paradox seems to be the more we protect certain buildings and parts of our environment, the more we isolate it the more we isolate the protected from the real, reinforcing the boundary between heritage and what we can only describe, I suppose, as non-heritage. In the UK, we have, in the United Kingdom, we've got rather used to that terrible expression, the heritage industry. This isn't a pejorative term, it's a serious idea developed to convince politicians that culture has economic value. On the one hand, of course, this has been useful to engage those who would otherwise not be interested. On the other hand, it tends to create an environment where culturally motivated activities must be measured and justified by explicit commercial result. While what we might call the heritage community is correctly developing attitudes towards non-tangible heritage, and understanding the wider societal importance of protection and encouragement, the real world is seeing it as a desirable scenography for tourism and the branding of cities, towns, and regions. Our immaculately protected and manicured historical centers are now the setting for luxury shopping and restaurants and mass tourism. Potemkin villages of architectural and urban quality that seem to relieve and unburden us of the difficulty of focusing our efforts on the more important and the less coherent and more wanting parts of our cities and towns. The unforeseen consequence of sprucing up our town centers that have become commercial and entertainment destinations seems to be an indifference to the rest of the city where most people live and work. The decline of physical retail further undermines this unbalanced approach to our environment. How can we build on the developed understanding of the importance of protecting the environment that we inherit and, and see that the qualities that we admire are the ones that should be the basis for the way we develop our towns and cities in a more general manner? 
I don't think I've ever heard developers, planners, or anybody else involved in projects, even politicians, ever say they were not interested in quality. Um, everybody claims that. Most projects and developments will be described in terms of quality and what they contribute to the city, even if these are false concerns. As we know, it's difficult to pin this down. And while we in this room probably have a fairly consistent idea of what we mean, it is not so easy to establish a common understanding when the concerns of the different parties are so conflicted. The term quality is too loose to give any security to a process that anyway depends on reassurance and anticipation. Architecture and planning take a long time, and therefore, um, you know, as, as architects and planners, we have no evidence uh, when we begin this process. Reinforcing the intentions with other concerns, as the um, uh, declaration, Davos Declaration does, functionality, context, etc., is, in my opinion, still no guarantee. Perhaps our concerns for sustain sustainability and community will be the thing that gives us common purpose. We are all beginning to understand that these concerns are not only about thermal and energetic performance, but also about the very act of building itself. As architects, we tend to be confined to looking at strategies of mitigation, but we know that the real decisions of what we build, where we build, how we build, need to be considered if we are to be, if we are really to address the issues that the industry that we are part of and make such a negative contribution to the erosion of physical identity on our built environment and its negative effect on the natural environment are really to be addressed. The Davos Declaration interestingly creates the proposition that careful construction and, and consideration of how we develop and care for our built environment is one of the most effective ways by which we might start to tackle what otherwise seem to be issues beyond our, well beyond our control. If we do think more about where we build, how we build, how we consider the existing qualities and conditions of where we live, perhaps we can begin to confront substantial challenges. If we can decouple development from its intimate relationship to economic advantage and instead couple it with the advantage to community and environment, we can find a way of embedding quality, not as a loose term of branding, but as a real criteria for development. If we are going to give weight and authority to these ambitions, we have to tackle the forces that tend to suppress them. In order to do that, we need to create a more convincing collaboration between politicians, local administrations, planners, investors, architects, and of course, citizens. I believe that issues of environment and sustainability are already helping us to do that, because firstly, they introduce criteria and concerns that are supportive of quality. They're supportive of planning, and secondly, they demand political will and public engagement, issues which architecture is often fails to, to, to achieve. The energy of investment and the free market has fueled a process of escalating land values, which promotes speculation. If we can use new criteria, then the question remains how to create new forms of administration, participation, in governments that is required. It is clear that without new emphasis on process, these ambitions are not achievable. Um, just as a, a last <coughs> ending um, piece, I don't know how much time I've got left, a few minutes. Um, I will show some lines. I've called this um, lessons from the front line. Um, and I'm going to flick through the first one so I don't get disappointed in that. Um, <clears throat> six years ago, I was asked by the, the president of Galicia, which is a region in northwest Spain, an autonomous region of about two and a half million people, 
to um, advise the administration on planning, uh, especially along the coast. The contradicting its stunning landscapes, the region is unfortunately famous for ugly construction in the cities, towns, and villages uh, along the coast. It's a well-known and discussed uh, issue there, and this, this issue is extremely stark because of the um, uh, beauty of the place itself. Due to the lack of consistent planning control, the previously charming towns and cities have been ravaged by uncontrolled development. This request inspired me to set up a, a small team of architects that has been operating in the region ever since. <clears throat> I don't want to um, explain our work, but only just to take some um, lessons that we have found working uh, not strategically, not um, in planning policy or anything, but really uh, in the front line itself. Um, and uh, so I only want to say as architects, you know, we're all architects. I have a team of four young architects who haven't designed a thing for six years um, and have only been concerned with traffic and um, other issues of the community. Um, if we are willing to surrender our normal focus on production and physical result, and instead to concentrate on process and agency, then I think we have a chance of bringing these issues together. And uh, that in that, uh, we, can, we can find ways of, of breaching and informing uh, process. Just very quickly, um, there are a number of things which <coughs> we've, we discovered uh, which were, were a consequence of disconnection between policy making and monitoring and, real, and realization on the ground. It was, it's been a really fascinating experience, not to be, as it were, um, at, uh, at the sort of uh, strategic level, but to see the, the inability of um, uh, mayors and planners to resolve issues uh, on the ground. And this is based on a lack of, of connection between uh, on-ground experience and, as it were, distance po policy making. There are a number of things which um, have uh, shape, and I, I realize I'm talking about a, a uh, much more of a rural community than most of us live in, but the issues are the same in some ways. Dominating everything is traffic. There's absolutely no doubt that um, traffic is, is one of the things that uh, uh, we've had to deal with most. And the reason this is interesting to talk about, because it's not that we can't deal with it, but it also exposes something more important, and that is the lack of, of horizontal con connectivity between different um, administrative responsibilities. This is one village of five towns, I would say, of five that um, have the most beautiful location on the, the waterfront. There are ports. Um, this used to be the high street, and over time, the high street's become a traffic road. When we tried, and we are now doing, um, to intervene uh, in this, to reduce the traffic, uh, we argued that this was an urban issue. The responsibility in the administration is the responsibility of the Minister of Transport. The Minister of Transport is not an urbanist and his responsibilities are not to do with what happens to a road when it goes through a town. It's been surprisingly difficult to put together these considerations, that when a road is in a town, surely it's as much about urbanism as it is about moving traffic. The difficulty of reducing the traffic speed here from 50 to 30 kilometers, which took us two years, um, was based on uh, 
breaking through that, these um, um, barriers. And so I think that, I mean, in, in a way, these, I mean, I could show you many other issues of um, erosion of, of urban quality through, um, uh, you know, through, through traffic. But the, the things that seem to be critical to us as, a, as an agency, uh, clearly it's to do with governance. Clearly there are issues, disconnects between um, what's, what's really happening, and that's the same whether it's in a, in a rural community or whether it's in a, in a borough like Hackney in London, between the challenges of a local authority and the way that policies are written. There tends to be poor process. That seems to be, in my opinion, the most critical thing. And process is the only way that we're going to find uh, our way out of this. And it's the only way we're going to guarantee uh, the, the issues and the concerns that the Davos Declaration. Um, there is an inability for local administrations to tackle issues that require changes in policy. There's a, as I've said, there's a lack of linking up between different departments, a lack of understanding that these things uh, complement each other. Um, and finally, I would say that the, the pressures of delivery uh, dominate most local authorities. A mayor who has a, a political um, future of three or four years is very concerned to deliver within that period. And therefore, the responsibility of delivery is often given to contractors. And in that process, the contractors become responsible for quality. There's no independent protection. And I think that's really important. Finally, I would say there's a lack of citizen particip participation. We don't know how to engage participation. We are so uh, naive at this. There are no real methods. In Berlin, we're involved in a few initiatives where there is a real attempt to try to do this, but this is something that we have to do. People don't feel part of the place they live. They feel decisions are not made on their behalf. They believe that the forces that make those decisions are to do with money or to do with politics and this. So my conclusions are that tackling the issue of quality in the built environment is a strategically intelligent way of engaging with the issues of, envir of environment and inequality. Sorry, I didn't say that very well. What I mean is the Davos Declaration, I think, is a really intelligent and correct way by which we might confront the issues of um, global warming, sustainability, and inequality. I think to do that, we have to uh, reconsider the whole process where we have underestimated the importance of planning um, and the, the, the general um, connection between the planning process, investors, and citizens that we have to, to force a more horizontal collaboration between authorities. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I would just return to that uh, you know, final conclusion. I think that the initiative is absolutely intelligent, that we need to build uh, quality of life. And this is something that we've We've understood um, in our foundation that if we can explain that the issues are regarding quality of life, maybe even more than quality of built environment, people don't understand that quite so well. But if they can sense that the issues we're dealing with, and it's not so difficult to argue that a good street, a nice park, good buildings improves quality of life. And I think this is something which uh, we should uh, you know, encourage. I applaud this initiative. Um, and 
I don't think you'll ever find an architect that doesn't um, support the notion that these questions become less the sole burden of professionals, planners and architects, and more shared by politicians, administrators, and by citizens themselves. Thank you very much. Dear David Chiberfield, thank you very much for your inspiring and so thoughtful uh, introduction. In the beginning, you said that uh, we know we must act, but we don't know how, and that's why we precisely the reason we are here and we're working for to learn better how to act uh, in future. Dear audience, I'm sure you will have uh, many questions and maybe also comments to make. You can do that later on. And uh, Sir David, you will stay with us uh, on the panel also, and we will continue now with the panel. The pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has taught us many things, and one is uh, certainly flexibility and how to react to the unexpected. So also our panel is a bit different in composition than originally uh, announced. I would like to invite the participants uh, of tonight's panel to the stage with a very warm welcome and a big thank you for them uh, for being here tonight to discuss Baukultur uh, with us. The panel will be moderated by Zneska uh, Kvartflik Mihailovic, Secretary General uh, of uh, Europa Nostra. Please, Zneska, take your seat on stage. I will ask uh, Sir David Chipperfield to come back on stage again. He will participate in the panel as the practitioner uh, in Baukultur. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Francisco de Paolo Coelho to come to the stage. He is the Dean of the European Investment Bank Institute and represents tonight uh, the European Investment Bank's world of finance and economics. Then we have two political decision makers. Um, Ms. anne katrin Bolle is the State Secretary at the German Federal Ministry of Interior, Building and Community, and such a, a, a high-level decision maker in the field of Baukultur, as well as is uh, Mr. Federal Councillor Alain Berset head of the Swiss Federal Department of Home Affairs and also our Minister of Culture and initiator of the Davos Declaration and the Davos Process. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours and we're looking forward very much to a very lively debate on high quality Baukultur. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oliver, Monsieur le Ministre, Madam State Secretary, Dear Sir David, dear Francisco, dear colleagues and friends, it is uh, my great honor to be the moderator of this high-level debate. Um, and um, I would like, on behalf of Europa Nostra, to um, sincerely thank uh, the Swiss federal government for uh, joining and contributing in such a meaningful way to the European Cultural Heritage Summit that we are holding uh, this year in Venice, and we are all excited because this is the very first uh, meeting in presence after one and a half years of the large uh, European cultural movement uh, family that is Europa Nostra. So to have you with us in Venice in this time is uh, of immense, immense importance. Um, and um, immense importance also to see how the civil society organization that have taken the initiative to organize this summit here uh, is in dialogue with uh, the highest political leaders. Um, and I think this is all about participation, Sir David, that you have been uh, so forcefully advocating uh, what, what is necessary, what we need more in today's um, world. Biennale Architectura 2021, the title is How Will We Live Together? The title of our summit is for a new European renaissance. Nothing less, nothing more, we are calling for a new European renaissance. But here tonight, we are talking about the importance of high quality Baukultur for that uh, new European renaissance and for the improving the quality of life 
for our living together. It all started with the adoption of the Davos Declaration in January 2018. The Swiss federal government, under your leadership, Monsieur le Ministre, decided uh, to convene a historical meeting uh, in uh, an, an iconic place in Switzerland, Davos. Um, Europa Nostra a été honoré d'être invité, et le fait que vous avez inclus la société civile uh, dans cette conférence. And we were honored, we were honored to be part of the signers. And I would like to start with one question. One question that was for the minister. Why Switzerland decided to uh, contribute to uh, the um, 2018 uh, year? and also putting the theme of the quality of Baukultur. Why did Swiss decide to put this theme in the, in the, in the uh, uh, declaration? I will be speaking in several languages. So I would like to tell you how happy I am to see you all and see you in person. For a long time, we could not see each other in person, and it was a pain. So now my my answer is very easy. In 2018, we identified in Switzerland the question of quality, of the high quality bow culture, and we thought that it was very important. And of course, this question, this issue was debated in many parts of the world, but it was not a structured question, a structured debate. So we have decided how to develop these uh, issues, and this is why we decided to have this conference in Davos. And Davos is not just just a place where culture uh, uh, the, in, in Davos, you speak not just about culture, you speak about politics and economics. Often, uh, culture in Davos was regarded as a hobby, as something, a pastime to spend a night with. So, in our idea, it was a central idea. When you talk about Bau Kultur, you have Bau and Kultur. You have two issues together. And I worked as a minister of the culture and not just as a person in charge for the building sector. So uh, we decided to gather with the culture ministers that were invited in Davos, and they are never invited in Davos. And this was to deal with this particular issue, to ponder on this issue, and to coordinate with several organiz international organizations, NGOs, that were there. And we also tried to ponder on to have an inspiration from the World Economic Forum in order to uh, also have other people reflect and ponder about uh, um, building and building culture. So when I heard the words of Mr. Chipperfield, uh, Sir Chipperfield, I heard that in several sectors, politics, uh, architecture, and other sectors of society, as I said earlier on, often we forget that the only true interest of what we do is to work for society, to work for human beings that are society and to constitute the society. And perhaps this is the issue that we have had for the past decades. Of course, we had many technological uh, uh, um, progresses, but we have perhaps forgotten culture. And this is something that we have to uh, take notice of. And this is why we have decided to have the Declaration of Davos. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, for your leadership. And thank you also for the leadership in your country, because I know that you really were really uh, eager, keen on having this concept. So I was present during that uh, event. It was a bridge with the World Economic Forum. And of course, we will come back on the uh, uh, idea of uh, giving, providing interest to the world of economy. Um, September 2021. In May uh, 
we, there is another document, I think you can find it also, um, um, some copies are available for the audience. It was another document, a follow-up document was adopted, the Davos Baukultur Quality System, defining the eight criteria for a high-quality Baukultur. Madam State Secretary, very often in Europe, English words are spreading around various countries. For the first, not for the first time, but rarely we have a concept that is a German language concept, the Baukultur, that has got into the various languages across Europe. So Germany definitely also played an important role in the mobilization about the promotion of this concept and also about the criteria for a high quality Baukultur. How much uh, political support uh, do you have in Germany for uh, this concept. Also, first of all, thank you, Madam Mihailovic. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you for the kind invitation. So this is my uh, first uh, trip to abroad since about two and a half years. Uh, and uh, I guess to share with lots of you uh, this feeling of talking in presence. And this is absolutely great. Thanks, thanks a lot. So. Uh, we do have a lot of support, and uh, in a way we are a bit uh, proud that this is Baukultur. There was only one other expression was uh, worldwide uh, in German, this was Kindergarten. <laughs> um, and uh, now it's Baukultur. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm thinking of this um, Baukultur for more than 10 years, 12 years by now. Because, uh, 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 my home country, Northern Westphalia, is uh, uh, one of those in, in Germany who said, okay, um, we have to discuss uh, in urban planning, we have to discuss not only with us, with planners, architects, and therefore we started Baukultur in Northern Westphalia the uh, um, 1996, first one. And um, we found um, a lot of uh, supporters in Berlin. One of them is sitting over there, my colleague Petra Wessler. And uh, we have this foundation, Baukultur, in, uh, in Germany. And uh, we have uh, Baukultur Days in Venice in about uh, a fortnight uh, right now. And um, it's mentioned by politics uh, in Berlin and all 16 countries. In, in, in Germany, and uh, we are proud of not co-invitating, not only co-invitating this process, and uh, uh, when the process started, all 16 countries in uh, Germany, uh, their conference, uh, yearly conferences, said, okay, we sign this, this declaration as well, and uh, I hope that this process, which is needed, and we have to talk to each other, Baukultur was uh, for a long time only for experts. Uh, and I guess it had reached policy. So therefore politics and those who are responsible for good governance, for the common good. Thank you for showing what a long path it is. So you have to prepare a lot of, lot of work of experts precedes then the sort of going to the higher um, a political level. Uh, we have here also uh, somebody who represents the economic, the banking world, represent the European Investment Bank Institute, uh, Francisco de Paula Coelho. Um, we have, with your help, published a little booklet which is called uh, Calling for a New Heritage Deal for Europe, uh, signed by our Executive President, Professor Dr. Hermann Patzinger. What is the role of high-level Baukultur for somebody who comes from the economic banking world and how, what is the importance of that concept for such an important institution as the European Investment Bank? Monsieur le Ministre, Madame la Secrétaire d'État, Sir David, Cher Sneska, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi avant... To... Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I would like to thank the Ministry of Culture 
the Swiss uh, ministers uh, for uh, inviting me to this panel. I am very satisfied because this is the first time I leave Brussels since the outbreak of the pandemic. And so uh, to uh, reply to the question of Zneskus, I would like to say that as a dean of the um, EIB, I, we, uh, you know, uh, are, um, uh, manage investments, so I would like to take this chance to express how Davos Declaration is important uh, for each and every of our operations, uh, because uh, EIB um, is a uh, bank that is not just uh, 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 in motion because of uh, commercial uh, uh, criteria. Of course, uh, we have uh, uh, commercial uh, targets, but profit is not our only uh, uh, purpose. Of course, it's just to take the, the, the just direction for the European Union. So the EIB has to take into consideration um, admission criteria that have to be all about quality, especially uh, environmental sustainability, social sustainability. These have to be very strict uh, criteria that we want to take in. To us, this is a very important commitment and we must we must update this criteria constantly today we have drawn up 11 uh, sustainability criteria uh, social sustainability and environmental sustainability and these were also we uh, had a debate a public debate last January and also Europa Nostra provided us uh, their uh, uh, ideas is about the Bau Kultur. These eight criteria of Bau Kultur are an indicator, are an indicator that somehow is underlining our criteria, is highlighting our criteria, because uh, unless these criteria are met, no one can receive our fundings. So, in order, first you have to follow best practices and then if they need consultations and so on, we will be available. So I would like to thank you for this opportunity that you gave me to speak before you today because we can speak about these criteria that have to be met. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for this answer. This is a very encouraging answer. Minister, I think that it must be very encouraging for you that uh, now the banks are taking inspiration uh, from the Davos Declaration. Uh, you s said that culture was for a very long time lacking, was lacking from all the uh, political uh, documentations at an international level. But now we have other document that are starting to talk about culture. How do you explain this phenomenon? What contributed to the fact that now there is more awareness at a political level and international level? So, so now the culture is more central. Well, in Switzerland, we have an advantage that is we have a different political system. And thanks to that, we were enabled to integrate all the elements, including culture, in our policies, in our pondering. So to us, culture is one of about 10 elements that are very important, healthcare or economy, but also um, culture. And then we also have our political system. We are seven. And each time you have to convince the other six about what you would like to do. And this gave us the possibility to reflect, to ponder on other things, and also to uh, take into consideration the specialties of other colleagues. So we were able to um, come up up with a product, so to say, that is good. So we have the right instruments, tools to uh, improve, enhance culture. So I was very happy to uh, hear you, to listen to what you said, because 
Also, Sir David Chipperfield said that it's all about collaboration and processes. That is also what she said earlier on uh, about it's the center, the heart of what she said. We need uh, good progress also uh, thanks to the Baukultur. And it has to be a strong process that needs collaboration among all of us. And also at a national level in Switzerland, we have several departments. So we all work together, joining forces to develop Baukultur. To, uh, to transpose this, uh, this, uh, this kind of work on the European level. But I hope it will be possible to do it so. Thank you. Uh, and the Switzerland is not a member of the European Union, yet uh, it gave a very important leadership and uh, sort of the, um, started uh, uh, with the Davos conference, the European Year of Cultural Heritage. Fortunately, we have here um, a State Secretary coming from a leading country of the European Union. Um, we all know that one year ago, President Ursula von der Leyen also launch, much to our surprise, as I say, um, the new European Bauhaus uh, um, concept as what she uh, defined only last week when she made the State of the Union uh, speech this year as the soul of the European Green Deal. So how much we can count on you, on Germany, to make sure that all these principles and criteria of high quality Baukultur will become uh, at the heart of the new European Bauhaus. So it's a bottom up process. And um, uh, lots of them, or lots of us, will define a new European Bauhaus very, very different. And I'm very you know, on this discussion that will come over there. So there is no concrete definition what is the new European Bauhaus. But um, at first, I'm convinced that not only the new European Bauhaus, um, uh, but all our efforts in this, um, we support from Germany um, the measures taken by the eight principles, um, the informal instruments, uh, and the documents that passed over uh, the last years. And uh, it's not only the Davos Declaration, this is one of the most important papers, it's the new Leipzig Charta. Um, and uh, we adopted by our EU presidency in, uh, oh, last year, yeah the end of last year, and uh, accepted by all European partners. Um, so uh, we in Germany, we are happy that we are involved um, in, in various initiatives as the European, on the European level to discuss culture in various contexts. So um, it's, whether it's the, the, the expert group or um, any uh, aims, whether it's uh, Italian or Switzerland or France. So we are very, very much together uh, uh, in this uh, in this field. Particular, um, the decision makers and policies, um, and in the fields of architecture, of planning, built environment, culture and heritage sectors, as you see here today. Um, we are um, together, I guess. And um, mm, what we start new now uh, is the process. We have to um, use all opportunities to include quality matters and current discussions and decisions in the EU policy. And this is what's uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen tries with the new European Bauhaus. Um, mm, so, challenges we have today, this is climate change, demographic change, digitalization, pandemic. Um, I guess it requires us to develop new and innovative strategies uh, for the environment. So, and what we've learned, and I'm very thankful that uh, Sir David mentioned this, um, that we can only achieve this high quality if we are working integrated and interdisciplinary ways. 
This is the most important thing. We have to talk with each other. We have to uh, plan together. We have to talk. We have to take... It's a long way. I do know this by, let's say, if, if there is a plan in a municipality and there is only four years for a mayor and he has to show at the end of the term anything else. This is not the way we plan our cities and our future. So um, it would be a very selfish way if you think that way. You have to talk to experts and experts would be, should, should be, um, let's say, not from an upper or higher level. So you have to talk to the people, ask what they need and what they want, and you have to be the expert to say, okay, this is the way it could be. And you have to be thinking integrated, not only looking for your personal aim or for your economic aim. So it must be for the common good. And this is what the, the new Leipzig Charta makes. And therefore, it belongs to Davos uh, Declaration. It belongs to the new European Bauhaus. And, um, well, this is what uh, should... Um, let's say, my hope and my vision is that we make, a, let's say, a better city in the end. Thank you. Thank you for coming constantly uh, back to the notion of common good. And uh, as you said, the bottom-up and the dialogue and connection and constructing a better, uh, better environment uh, and a better quality of life. As uh, Sir David, you, you ended your, uh, as usual, very inspiring uh, message that you shared with us here. Um, you spoke a lot um, about the necessity to sort of connect the heritage world and the non-heritage world, as you have said, and um, in your, your career you have done a lot to connect these, these, these two worlds. I think you are probably the only laureate at European level both of the Miss van der Rohe um, um, Prize uh, for Contemporary Architecture and the Europa Nostra Grand Prix for Heritage for the same project of the Neues Museum in Berlin. So, um, how do you... You spoke also about the... the, 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 the we, we, I just mentioned that, that basically all uh, high-quality Baukultur and uh, a new European Bauhaus is aimed to also give a soul to the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, and all our, not just European Union, but international uh, mobilization for climate action. How much is the architecture and heritage world aware of the role that they have to play in the climate action? Um, I think they're very aware. The, the problem is, um, like all of us, how do, we, how do we sit in the same chair and yet move it? You know, how do we... Uh, it's, we, have, we have a lot invested in things. So take a, a typical commercial architectural practice. I think there are a whole lot of things that probably we know quite well we shouldn't be building. That might be tall buildings, let's say. Um, but how, how, I mean, well, let me come clean. In, in a sense, the reason I have a foundation in Galicia is because I'm trying to find another chair. At the same time, I'm trying, we try in our offices to shift our chair to think more about tackling these issues. The trouble is, we're so far down the food chain that what architects are left to do is think about better windows, you know, are, are the materials we're using, uh, you know, CO2 loaded or not? Are the insulating techniques we're using better? Are our materials local? We can do that. We can put solar panels on top of buildings. 
But the real, quest, the real decisions are made much before. Should you be building there in the first place? Should you be, you know, building so far away from, from, from a transport interchange? Or should be, so the, the big decisions are made before we design, choose windows. Uh, it, at that point, we're fiddling. It's, it's Titanic uh, deck chairs. The shame is that as a profession, we've isolated ourselves to be the window designers and the image makers. Uh, and I think this is where we have to really readdress ourselves. I mean, last year I volunteered to be the editor of Domus magazine, which coincided really strangely with the whole COVID thing. So it did give me something to do um, uh, on my weekends. But uh, I challenged all my, I mean, my, my, my manifesto was what is our role? And I challenged my colleagues, uh, what do they think architectural practice should be under these conditions? And it was very interesting how um, the, everybody is desperate to try to, to think about how, how to, to change. Interestingly, the European-centric uh, profession uh, has always been an example for the non-European, the so-called developing world. I mean, they, the, the so-called developing world always looked at European architects for inspiration. Interestingly, now, European architects are looking at architects in the developing world with a certain amount of admiration and jealousy because they seem to be tackling real things. They have real problems on their hands, and they are explicitly tackling them. You know, housing, flooding, all sorts of things. Because whereas we are still embedded in a slightly more isolated professional position. I think, you know, I, I love architecture. I love making things. I love designing things. But architecture isn't, has no purpose on its own. Architecture is for something. It isn't in its, you know, no one wants a building. People want a home or they need a school, or they need. So, the software is just as important, if not more important. Good buildings are the combination of purpose and substance, not, not one or the other. And this is my little bit my worry about the, the reference to heritage and our historic centers becoming um, slightly Disneyland. You know, I think the heritage community has to be and, and is a bit nervous that you know, we protect all these buildings and then they just become scenographic backdrops for shopping and tourism. I mean, is that why we're doing it? I mean, surely not. So I, I think the questions about settlement, the quality of settlement is to do with the quality of life not, you know, and how do we get to that? And, and, I, and I think this is something which is sitting between us all. And I think architects have to get less obsessed with products and more interested in process. And we, we have to find ways of um, sharing the responsibility of quality. You know, I mean, I, I've spent my life, you know, sitting on one side of the table with my teams, standing up for quality. It's really difficult if the, the other side of the table isn't there. So I think the points that are being made here is that this is a shared societal and political responsibility. It cannot be carried by architects, because basically, I think architects have gone to the easy ground. They've, they've gone to, I mean, and all of us would love to do social housing. There isn't any, I mean, there's no social, in England, there's no social housing. What's, there's no, there's no interest in building settlements. Someone said to me, a politician said to me the other day, 
Yeah, we don't like the word community. It sounds like communism. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this uh, plaidoirie for uh, pour plus de sens, more meaning in everything we're doing and for sharing. Monsieur le ministre, tout uh, le processus de Davos, it's all about sharing. Uh, mais c'est aussi... Uh, David a parlé de la qualité de vie, mais puisque vous êtes aussi le ministre So are you also responsible for health, not only quality of life, because we're going through a period in which health is one of the main worries of decision makers, of political decision makers. So my question is, which is a contribution which, in your opinion, can be given by quality buildings, which is a contribution to the mental and physical health of our citizens. And well, before answering to your question, I would like to expand on quality because we were actually talking about the definition of quality. What do we mean by quality? An example I've heard has significantly stricken me. In Bern, there is an area where you have the motorway, the railway station, and many architects have been involved, but the result has been disappointing. Technical issues have been taken into due consideration, forgetting about the common denominator amongst all the parts, including the cultural ones that give the soul to the result. So technically and functionally, this is a top solution, but that is not enough. Therefore, when defining quality, you should also keep this into consideration. Now, back to your question regarding health. Well, we can talk about the environment, the built environment. And during the pandemic, we have realized that aspects which we had neglected have come back to the foreground. So which is the meaning that we can give to social interaction access to green areas. Well, we have seen a movement developing in Switzerland. In the past, we had people moving away from the countryside, but now the opposite is happening. Is this going to be temporary? Will things continue in this direction? We do not know. Maybe this will have to do with the way we have to integrate built areas with our social and economic world. I don't know, but something has truly happened. So we need to think about this. And planners have to think about this as well. And then I would like to move to a different topic, politics. Politicians certainly have a role to play. Which type of rules do we need? Sir David Chipperfield was talking about this. How can architect work? We need rules, that's for sure. Maybe we need to negotiate. Maybe we need to find an agreement, to be able to share values regarding how to build and how to do it. Then, of course, people have different specializations. And then in the end, we should have a contract regarding what we need to do. But this is a social contract. It is a contract that pertains society and politics. So the connection between health and environment is a clear one. And we have all realized that you may feel well or you may feel badly in a given place, and that will have consequences for your health. So in the end, all this is important for human beings, for social communities. Buildings have a meaning only in this direction. They have to give something to society. They have to provide a service to society. So the connection is very, very strong, and so is the culture, which is absolutely central. Thank you very much. You 
have mentioned public interest, health. Economic actors, the private sector. And that is also one of the very important reasons why, as you have explained, uh, the, the Davos conference took place in Davos, just on the eve of the World Economic Forum. We have here the representative of the European Investment Bank. Um, how do you think we can get more the private sector, uh, private investors in this conversation? We are talking about necessity for sharing. Uh, we have a lot of discussion because experts, politicians, uh, civil society, but much less with the world of economy, the world of money. Well, to start with, I should say that we don't have any preconceived ideas about the color of the cat. It may be private, it may be public, gray, black, or white. Uh, we are concerned by the result. And in that respect, early on, Sneske, you seem to express some surprise by the fact that we and EU institutions were adopting criteria um, emanating from Davos. Um, bear in mind that we land all over the world. 85 to 90% of our projects are located in the European Union, but the remaining 10 to 15% are all over the world in over 100 continents, 100 countries in the five continents roughly two-thirds private, one-third public. And every time we lend to a project located outside the EU, we have a rule. And that rule is that we should apply the most demanding criteria, being in the field of greenhouse gas emissions, gender parity, human rights, you name it, the most demanding between the EU criteria had that project been located in the EU or the one prevailing in the country, in host country where the project is located. So we are always aiming at the most um, demanding criteria. Now when it comes to the role that private sector should play in the rehabilitation of um, endangered cultural sites, it is a fact that public money, being at national, provincial, or European level, is not sufficient to cover the vast uh, universe of uh, uh, monuments, particularly in Europe. So we have to find new sources of finance, and we have to involve the private sector in bringing in the resources, the financial resources, but also the know-how, allowing those sites to have a commercial and intelligent reuse. This is a process that we, the EIB, we try to foster. There are some good examples in Europe. I believe uh, the Spaniards, Spain was somewhat uh, precursor with the uh, Paradores in the 20s and the 30s. There are some uh, systematic, there's some interesting experience on the European countries. However, I notice that in some countries, this is still very much a taboo. It is still considered that to allow the commercial use of a public monument as an alienation or, uh, which of course can be very detrimental if best practices and a very strict control on the way the endangered monument is rehabilitated is not ensured. But this is a role that we at the EIP, we, we, we're happy to do by making the bridge between those endangered sites for which simply there isn't enough money and uh, private promoters. The choice for many of those endangered sites is not between public funding and private funding, is private funding or no funding at all. Thank you, we shall definitely count on you as an ally, as a bridge to the, the economic world uh, in the future as we will continue uh, uh, working on implementation because I think we, it's not only adopting, defining these uh, principles and criteria, uh, now the challenge is for all of us is to really make them work. Um, State Secretary, would you say that the pandemic is uh, more a threat or rather an opportunity to put these issues more uh, at the center 
of priorities in political terms and political decision making. Um, <clears throat> I guess we learned, and we're still learning, uh, from the COVID pandemic. And um, just if you look in our quarters, uh, we suddenly saw schools, playgrounds, shops, restaurants closed down. And um, our culture, our urban culture was paused in a way. So uh, um, what we learned, especially in Germany, um, that the desperate need for accessible greens, for um, high quality public space, uh, and I just saw your example with the parking slots and passes for cars and uh, uh, <coughs> transport uh, in the lead. So um, I guess we, we learned that our neighborhoods need flexible designs. We need uh, a quality configuration of our um, municipalities. And um, therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that in the last days of uh, this government, uh, we had the chance to put out 250 millions just for concept, just for ideas for our municipalities, just giving them the chance, besides the uh, uh, four or five years term of reigning a city, um, to ask and to discuss with the uh, <clears throat> those who need it, who live in the cities, and experts, just to make in plans how could our future be with the quality standards, especially the quality standards of uh, the Davos uh, Declaration. And um, <clears throat> I guess we realize, all of us in Europe, that not only trade and commercial services and, uh, are relevant for our cities. Um, we need features that contribute to the quality uh, of those places. It's the social and social and education facilities. This makes our city, not only the commercial things. So uh, we need to foster, really to foster um, in public and green spaces um, in those parts of our cities. So it's a demand for useful land consumption, because uh, land is not endless given. Um, and for healthier cities, for resilient cities, um, and for the climate change, all belongs together. I think the, it's a lesson we learned from the COVID uh, pandemic. So it I is an opportunity not to be missed. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. I would like just to ask um, our team, because we also have people who are watching uh, this conversation, high-level uh, panel uh, debate uh, online. Uh, do we have perhaps some questions that uh, uh, the audience, uh, online audience has asked? And also, I think we have time for um, one uh, question also from uh, this audience. Uh, first, our team, is there uh, anything that we can uh, convey uh, from the online participants? See? Okay. Thank you, Sneska. We can maybe first pick up a couple of questions uh, from the physical audience where, while the team collects additional comments from online audience. So, do we have any, anybody who would like to... Yes, I see. Uh, please uh, present yourself and uh, make a brief question. Paolo Vitti, Europa Nostra. For this very interesting uh, discussion, uh, quality of settlement, quality of life. Historic cities becoming a kind of Disney world. But people need to have models like the historic cities. 
where the quality of life is having no cars, Venice, and uh, you really have more social um, gatherings. So could be the model of the historic city, the model for the new Baukultur city. Thank you, Paolo. Who would like to comment? Uh, so, David? I, I'd like to pick that up and also come back on the point about the parador that you made. Because I think the parador, uh, uh, they, and they will be connected. Um, the, the example you used of the way that it was, actually it was Franco who invented the parador system, strangely. Um, but what the parador system did was that the, the government invested in the infrastructures, which took the commercial pressure off of the, the hotel operator. So most, hot, most paradors could not operate a building that size or do the works that were required to do it. So basically what happens is that the government then does the work, creates an, artificially, an artificial commercial environment in a way within which an operator can work and I think that's quite interesting because if you don't do that then the investor has to come in and say well I, I need 150 rooms I need to knock these walls down I need so what we know that in a case like a paradox you need to work with the building and not against it and that means you have to so it needs some intervention in terms of, because um, I, I think, you know, who is going to argue against, you know, the historic city? I mean, we all love the historic city. The concern is, does the historic city remain a place where people live, or is it just an entertainment? Is it a hollowed out uh, place where no one can afford to live? And I think this is... This is the, the problem, I think, that uh, tourism uncontrolled is creating and, and obviously the leveraging of land values, we're seeing it in London. I mean, London is becoming also a sort of hollow city that no one can afford to live in the middle anymore. So if land values become so high, and I think, you know, Berlin, it's a very interesting story in Berlin where there's such an anxiety about gentrification because there's a genuine fear that the kebab shop won't be able to survive if, um, you know, the, the rents go up and et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think those are very valid concerns, and I think, it's, it's, there's a switch, and why has the switch happened? The switch is happening because we're worried about the environment. If we weren't worried about that, I don't think we would be so worried about things costing more and more. And I think that's why, I think this moment is interesting because I think the environmental anxieties are the things that will save us. It will. It's the thing which has the chance to bring us together. And I think that's why it's interesting about this initiative, because if we can, can, can link quality of life with quality of environment, and quality of environment with sustainability, and sustainability with uh, societal equality, et cetera, et cetera, then you, as architects, we're not just trying to argue for quality just for its sake. It has, it's protected by bigger ideas. And that's what it has to be. Yeah, so we are all moved by the sense of urgency. Uh, we can have one more question, Oliver. Is it okay? So one, I know that, uh, yeah. Yes, please. I think the microphone is coming. Just a moment. So, uh, my name is Catalina, Ambulance for Monuments. Um, and before you spoke about a horizontal structure in the 
uh, in an interdisciplinary way managing um, our contemporary issues, like the local administration working together with urban professionals, economic actors, etc. What I'm wondering about what are what the major changes or strategies need to be in order for this to happen in a profoundly hierarchical structure like our contemporary society is. Anybody would? Was not very. Uh, well, I, I'm just not sure I've understood the question. Sorry, yeah. but uh, maybe maybe the the, the, the the best answer is to the integration, to integrate all these fields together in physical meetings, to meet, to know each other, to be able to work together, and to stop these uh, closed boxes where we are working. Usually, in, in the politics, for example, but I guess it's also the same for other other people working. We have the tendency to, to be very strong, focused on our, uh, our own own uh, own job, and uh, the, the the main world may be openness to be open to other uh, to other um, well fields and to to work together. And I think the, the the Davos Declaration is working right in this in this direction. It's maybe a part of the of the answer. Uh, I, I try next to answer. So um, there won't be one solution for all problems. Um, and this is why it's so important to concentrate uh, on process and participation. So um, let me say uh, in, in, in this way, we can only succeed if we join our forces. Um, and it's your force, not mine, political, it's the experts for us and it's uh, the money we need, lots of money we need. Um, and we have to be experimental, creative and just do. That's my answer. Just do it before it's too late. And very honest, I think for our cities, it's a bit past 12 o'clock. Past 12 o'clock. I see that we are past 23, 2030. I'm looking at my dear colleague Oliver. Could we have uh, five, five, ten, uh, one, five minutes more for the, because I would like to ask the, but we could ask one question more, you think? One last question from the online audience, perhaps? Yes, Lorena, do we have? Yes, we have a couple, actually, but I will only choose one. So it's for uh, Sir David Chipperfield. You talked about your experience in Galicia and the fact that the high street of the town became traffic roads. So the question is, why is bicycle infrastructure so very far down the list of fixes to make our cities better? This is a question from Richard Armiguer, your first and favorite model maker. <laughs> um, thank you, Richard. Um, <laughs> look, it, it goes back to the last question. Everything is connected through. I'm not particularly interested in traffic. Um, so being involved in traffic planning for the last three years in these five towns is not high on my priority. But the reason we're doing it is because we're actually interested in the identity of those towns. If you expand that, we could even say, I'm not that interested in that either. What the challenge for our, that particular region is, is that people are, young people are leaving. And our theory is that if the quality of the towns and the quality of the environment is eroded, then their reasons for staying there become less. So all of a sudden, you've got connection between you know, uh, the, the, the demographic issue of, of people leaving, the 
problem of traffic and the issue of urban identity or compounding. Therefore, you have to look at these things together. And of course, one way, then you find yourself, as we are doing, and we actually, we put forward a, a mobility plan for the whole region, you've then got to go back higher upstream and say, okay, what can you do with cars? You can't get rid of cars in a rural community in the way that you can in the city. It's much more difficult. But what you can do is to start to look at other ways of mobility. And that's what we're doing as well. And that's the problem. We started off as urban planners. We're now looking at mobility plans. We're looking at, at all sorts of other forestry initiatives, all sorts of other things, because if, if you see the connections, you have to go there. And you've got to be willing to uh, be agency between these, these initiatives. And I have to say, traffic planning in, these, in that region is fundamental to everything. I mean, you, there's no point discussing urbanism. You have to talk about traffic, first of all. And you can't just get rid of it. You, it's fundamental to the community, so you've got to have solutions. And that's what I'm saying, is that I, I think you know, you, you can't come with, with formalistic preconceived ideas of what the answer is. You, you have to engage process. And in the process, you have to start to look at overlaps. And you have to look at the implications and the consequences of things. Thank you. It's all about a lot of bridges that we have to make between many stakeholders about the holistic vision and about the sense of urgency. To close, I would like to ask each of uh, uh, the members of that panel to say, sort of, what would each of you do institutionally and personally to contribute to making the principles of high-quality bioculture a reality? Shall we start with the European Investment Bank? If I have to summarize it in one single word, I would say lasting. Would lasting. Say? Durable. Do you would say? If I have to sum up my main concern in uh, um, an investment selection, I would use the criteria lasting. Lasting. Okay. Thank you, Madam Secretary, uh, State Secretary. Can you help us to convince Ursula von der Leyen and all the other European leaders, uh, the European Union leaders, it's that it's uh, it's quality it's and beauty also ought to be much higher on the political agenda? Quality, beauty, affordable, and always for the common good. Thank you, Sir David. A special message for our Venetian um, audience. How would you apply, how we can apply this principle on Venice? I think we've said it already, and I think, you know, I don't want to repeat. I think the only thing, I mean, the, the, uh, the Bauhaus has been mentioned, this new European Bauhaus, and the principles of the Bauhaus was the, the concept of aligning design, designers, and creative thought with industry and um, the industrialization of products to the benefit of, you know, to, to make the best possible things for the most possible people for the least possible price. Um, that's not an arrangement you can go to a bank for anymore um, because the, the, the margins are not the right ones. Uh, but this is what we have to think about. We have to think about how we can, can shift into this idea that design and creativity is at the service of quality, and that's a shared quality, you know, and it's to do with the way people live. It's not only about, um, you know, a sector or, uh, you know, a part of the community. Thank you. Monsieur le Ministre. Yeah, I have maybe three points. The first point is to remain creative, 
but to be more practical and more uh, political. And more practical also to explain what means Baokultur. We know here what means Baokultur, but for a lot of people it's not so clear, the concept. And to be more political, to be engaged with uh, a political level, to explain and to explain and to explain and to integrate the, the forces. The second point, and that's the answer for Switzerland, is to make the integration on the political level not only at the federal level, you know, but to also to have the cantons and to have the cities with us. And we have to do a lot to, uh, to reach that uh, the concept as a Baukultur uh, well known, uh, is well known everywhere. And the third point, uh, if I may uh, say that here, um, I think we have to, uh, to uh, actively support uh, the, the, the Davos process to continue on that, uh, on that way. And it is also a great pleasure for me to, uh, to invite you maybe for a, second, for a second conference of ministers to have this occasion to meet there with ministers, but also with all, all people they, uh, they, they have to, to, to say something in that field to work, to work together and maybe to uh, uh, be prepared for a new, for the next uh, conference of ministers of culture in Davos, uh, why not in January 23. It may be a good occasion after the pandemics to, uh, to start again very strong together with uh, uh, also with, with physical meetings. This is, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful um, uh, announcement for the end of this high level panel. There will be a new gathering in Davos, January 2023, the ministers, but I hope the civil society will be again invited because as you can see, the civil society responded very, uh, very, um, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm for this process. As you said, you started a movement uh, in Davos and uh, I hope that all our audience present here, also all the audience following us online will continue spreading the word and continue contributing because we have to make it work as you said uh, we don't have time there is a sense of urgency and we have to work together so once again a great uh, many many thanks to the members of this high level panel and special thanks to the uh, two ministers who accepted this formula because this is uh, always uh, very special from the ministers to accept to have a conversation with um, uh, the experts and the, the, the civil society so thank you for being with us and thank you also I have the honor on behalf of the Swiss um, uh, Federal Office for Culture to invite you for um, an evening reception where you can continue conversations uh, about the importance and uh, implementation of the high quality Baukultur principles. Thank you for being asked and enjoy the rest of the evening.